This is Jonathan Frid, actor, reader number 167. I am reading book four, part two, chapters five, six, and seven. The life of nations is not contained in the lives of a few men, but the connection between these few men and the nations has not been found. The theory that this connection is based on the transference of the collective will of a people to certain historical personages is an hypothesis not confirmed by the testimony of history. The theory of the transference of the collective will of the masses to historical personages may perhaps explain much in the sphere of jurisprudence and is perhaps essential for its purposes. But in its application to history, as soon as revolutions, conquests, or civil wars occur, that is, as soon as history begins, this theory explains nothing. The theory seems irrefutable just because the act of transference of the people's will cannot be verified, since it never occurred. Whatever event may occur, whoever may stand at the head of that event, the theory can always claim that such and such a person took the lead because the collective will was transferred to him. And the answers given by this theory to the questions of history are like the replies of a man who, watching the movements of a herd of cattle and paying no attention to the varying quality of the pasturage in different parts of the field or to the driving of the herdsmen, should attribute the direction the herd takes to what animal happens to be at its head. The herd goes in that direction because the animal in front leads it, and the collective will of all the animals is vested in that leader. Such is the answer given by historians of the first category, those who assume an unconditional transference of power. If the animals leading the herd change, this happens because the collective will of all the other animals is transferred from one leader to another, according to whether the leader leads them in the direction selected by the whole herd. Such is the answer given by historians who assume that the collective will of the masses is vested in rulers under conditions which they regard as known. With this method of observation, it often happens that the observer, influenced by the direction he himself prefers, regards those as leaders who, owing to the people's change of direction, are no longer in front but on one side, or sometimes in the rear. If the animals in front are continually changing, and the direction of the whole herd continually changes, this is because, in order to follow a given direction, the animals transfer their will to those that have attracted our attention. And to study the movements of the herd, we must watch the movements of all the prominent animals moving on all sides of the herd. So say the third category of historians, who accept historical persons from monarchs to journalists as the expression of their age. The theory of the transference of the will of the masses to historical persons is merely a paraphrase, a restatement of the question in different words. What is the cause of historical events? Power. What is power? Power is the collective will vested in one person. On what condition is the people's will vested in one person? On the condition that the person expresses the will of the whole people. That is, power is power. In other words, Power is a word the meaning of which we do not know. If the sphere of human knowledge were confined to abstract reasoning, and then having subjected to criticism the explanation of power which juridical science gives us, mankind would conclude that power is merely a word and has no existence in reality. But for knowing phenomena, man has, besides abstract reasoning, another instrument experience by which to verify the results of thinking. And experience tells him that power is not merely a word, but an actually existing phenomenon. Not to speak of the fact that no description of the collective activity of men can dispense with the concept of power, 
The existence of power is proved both by history and by observing contemporary events. Whenever an event occurs, a man or men appear by whose will the event seems to have taken place. Napoleon III issues a decree, and the French go to Mexico. The King of Prussia and Bismarck issue decrees, and an army enters Bohemia. Napoleon I gives a command, and an army marches into Russia. Alexander I gives a command, and the French submit to the Bourbons. Experience shows us that whatever event occurs, it is always related to the will of one or of several men who have decreed it. The historians, from an old habit of acknowledging divine intervention in human affairs, look for the cause of events in the expression of the will of someone endowed with power. But that supposition is not confirmed either by reason or by experience. On the one hand, Reason shows that the expression of man's will, his words, are only part of the general activity expressed in an event, as, for instance, in a war or a revolution. And so, without the assumption of an incomprehensible supernatural force, a miracle, it is impossible to admit that words can be the immediate cause of the movements of millions of men. On the other hand, even if we admitted that words could be the cause of events, history shows that the expression of the will of historical personages does not, in the majority of cases, produce any effect. That is to say, their commands are often not executed, and sometimes the very opposite of what they order occurs. Without admitting divine intervention in the affairs of mankind, we cannot accept power as the cause of events. Power from the standpoint of experience is merely the relation that exists between the expression of someone's will and the execution of that will by others. To explain the conditions of that relationship, we must first establish a concept of the expression of will, referring it to man and not to the deity. If the deity gives a command, expresses his will, as the history of the ancients tells us, the expression of that will is independent of time and is not evoked by anything, for the deity is not controlled by an event. But when we speak of commands that are the expression of the will of men, acting in time and related to one another, we must, if we are to understand the connection of commands with events, restore, one, the conditions of all that takes place, the continuity of movement and time, both of the events and of the person who commands, and two, the condition of the indispensable connection between the person who issues the commands and those who execute them. Chapter 6 Only the expression of the will of the deity, not dependent on time, can relate to a whole series of events occurring over a period of years or centuries. And only the deity, prompted by no temporal agency, can by his sole will determine the direction of mankind's movement. Man, however, is subject to time and himself participates in the event. Restoring the first condition omitted, that of time, we see that no command can be executed without some preceding command having been given, rendering the execution of the last command possible. No command ever emerges spontaneously, or itself covers a whole series of events. But each command follows from another, and never refers to a whole series of events, but always to one moment only of an event. When we say, for instance, that Napoleon ordered armies to go to war, we combine in one simultaneous expression a whole series of consecutive commands dependent one upon another. Napoleon could not have commanded an invasion of Russia and never did command it. One day he ordered certain papers to be written to Vienna, Berlin, and Petersburg. 
The following day, certain decrees and commands were issued to the army, the fleet, the commissariat, and so on and so on. Millions of commands, which formed a whole series corresponding to the series of events that brought the French armies into Russia. If throughout his reign, Napoleon gives commands concerning an invasion of England, expending on no other undertaking so much time and effort, and yet not once during the entire reign attempts to execute this design, but undertakes an expedition into Russia, a country with which, according to his repeatedly expressed conviction, he considers it advantageous to be in alliance, this arises from the fact that his commands corresponded to the course of events in the latter, but not in the former case. For a command to be executed with certainty, it is necessary that a man should command what can be executed. But to know what can and what cannot be executed is impossible, not only in the case of Napoleon's campaign in Russia, in which millions participated, but even in the most uncomplicated event. For in either case, millions of obstacles may arise to prevent its execution. Every command executed is always one of an immense number unexecuted. All the impossible commands are inconsistent with the course of events and are not carried out. Only the possible ones are linked up with a consecutive series of commands corresponding to a series of events and are executed. Our erroneous idea that an event is caused by the command that precedes it is due to the fact that when the event has taken place, and out of thousands of commands, those few that were consistent with the event have been executed, we forget about the others that were not executed because they could not be. Apart from this, the chief source of our error in this matter arises from the fact that in the historical accounts of a whole series of innumerable, diverse, and petty events, such as all those which led the French armies into Russia, is generalized into one event in accord with the result produced by that series of events. And by a corresponding generalization, a whole series of commands is also summed up into a single expression of will. We say that Napoleon wished to invade Russia, and he did so. In reality, however, we never find in all Napoleon's activity anything resembling an expression of that wish. What we find is a series of commands or expressions of his will of the most diverse and undefined tenor. One of the countless series of his unexecuted commands, one series, that for the campaign of 1812, was actually carried out. And not because those orders differed in any way from the other unexecuted orders, but because that particular series of commands coincided with the series of events that led the French army into Russia. Just as in stencil work, one or another figure comes out, not because the color was applied from this side or that, but because it was laid on from all sides over the figure cut in the stencil. So that examining the relation in time of the commands to the events, we find that a command can never be the cause of the event, but that a definite interdependence exists between the two. To understand in what this interdependent consists, it is necessary to restore another omitted condition of every command that proceeds not from the deity but from a man, which is that the man who gives the command himself takes part in the event. It is precisely this relation of the commander to those he commands that is called power. The relation consists in the following. For common action, men always unite in certain combinations, in which, regardless of the difference of the aims set for their common action, the relation between those taking part in it always remains the same. Men uniting in these combinations always stand in such a relation to one another that the larger number takes a more direct part and the smaller number a less direct part in the collective action for which they have combined. One of the most striking and explicit examples of all these combinations in which men unite for collective action is an army. 
Every army is composed of lower ranks of the service, the common soldiers, of whom there are always the greatest number. Of the next higher military rank, corporals and non-commissioned officers, of whom there are fewer than of the former. And of still higher officers, of whom there are still fewer, and so on to the highest military command, which is concentrated in one person. A military organization may be quite accurately compared to the figure of a cone, the base of which, with the largest diameter, consists of the rank and file, the next higher and smaller section of the cone consists of the next higher grades of the army, and so on to the apex, the point of which will represent the commander-in-chief. The soldiers, of whom there are the greatest number, form the lower section of the cone and its base. The soldier himself does the stabbing, hacking, burning, and pillaging, and always receives orders for these actions from men above him. He himself never gives an order. The non-commissioned officer, of whom there are fewer, performs the action itself less often than the soldier, but he gives a certain number of commands. An officer still less often acts directly himself and still more frequently commands. A general does nothing but command the army and hardly ever uses a weapon himself. The commander-in-chief never takes direct part in the action but only gives general orders concerning the movements of the mass of troops. A similar relation prevails among individuals in every combination of men for a common activity, in agriculture, commerce, and every sort of administration. And so, without excessively dividing all the contiguous sections of a cone and ranks of an army, or the ranks and positions of any administrative or public body from the lowest to the highest, we see a law by which men, to take common action, combine in such relations that the more directly they participate in the action, the more numerous they are and the less they command, while the less direct their participation in the action itself, the fewer they are and the more they command, rising in this way from the lowest ranks to the man at the top, who takes the very least direct share of the action and more than all the rest devotes his activity to commanding. It is this relation between the men who command and those they command that constitutes the essence of the concept called power. Having restored the condition of time under which all events occur, we find that a command is executed only when it is related to a corresponding series of events. Restoring the essential condition of connection between those who command and those who execute the command, we find that by the very nature of the case, those who command take the smallest part of the action itself and that their activity is exclusively directed to commanding. Chapter 7 When an event takes place, men express their opinions and desires in regard to it. And as the event results from the collective activity of many men, some one of the opinions or wishes expressed is certain to be at least approximately fulfilled. When one of the opinions expressed is fulfilled, that opinion becomes connected with the event as a command preceding it. Men are hauling a log. Each of them gives his opinion as to how and when to haul it. They haul the log away, and it turns out that it has been done in accordance with what one of them said. He ordered it. There we have command and power in their primary form. The man who worked most with his hands could think least about what he was doing or reflect on what would be the result of the common activity or give a command. The man who commanded most was obviously the least able by reason of his verbal activity to perform direct manual labor. In a large group of men directing their activity to a common end, there is still a sharper division of those who, because their activity is directed to commanding, take a less direct part in the work. When a man acts alone, he always bears in mind a certain set of considerations, which, as it seems to him, directed his past activity, justify his present activity, and guide him in planning future acts. The very same thing is done by groups of men, allowing those who do not take a direct part in the action to devise considerations, justifications, and conjectures concerning their collective activity. For reasons known or unknown to us, 
the French begin to cut down and destroy one another. And corresponding to and accompanying this event, the justification for it is expressed in people's belief that this is necessary for the welfare of France, for liberty, and for equality. Men cease to kill one another, and the accompanying justification is the necessity for the centralization of power, resistance to Europe, and so on. Men march from the west to the east, slaying their fellow men. And this event is accompanied by phrases about the glory of France, the baseness of England, and so on. History shows us that these justifications of events have no general meaning and are contradictory, as in the killing of a man as a consequence of recognizing his rights, and the slaughter of millions in Russia for the humiliation of England. But these justifications have a very necessary significance in their own day. Such justifications release those who cause the events from moral responsibility. These temporary aims are like the brooms attached to the front of locomotives to clear the snow from the rails. They clear man's moral responsibility from his path. Without these justifications, there could be no solution to the very simplest question that presents itself when examining each historical event. How is it that millions of men commit collective crimes, wars, murders, and so on. With the present complex forms of political and social life in Europe, can one think of any event that would not have been prescribed, decreed, or ordered by monarchs, ministers, parliaments, or newspapers? Is there any collective action that cannot find its justification in political unity and patriotism, in the balance of power or in civilization? so that every event that occurs inevitably coincides with some expressed wish and receiving justification presents itself as the result of the will of one man or of several men. In whatever direction a ship moves, the billowing waves created by the prow cleaving the water will always be discernible. To the men on board, the movement of those waves will be the only perceptible motion. Only by watching closely, moment by moment, the movement of these waves and comparing it to the movement of the ship, do we convince ourselves that every instant of that billowing motion is determined by the movement of the ship, and that we were led into error by the fact that we ourselves were imperceptibly moving. We see the same thing if we watch, moment by moment, the movement of historical personages. That is, if we restore the inevitable condition of all that occurs, the continuity of movement and time, and do not lose sight of the essential connection of historical persons with the masses. When the ship moves in one direction, there is the same billowing ahead of it. When it changes direction frequently, the waves ahead also turn frequently. But wherever it may turn, there will always be the surge ahead anticipating its movement. Whatever happens, it always appears that just that event was foreseen and decreed. Wherever the ship may go, the billowing waves, which neither direct nor increase its movement, surge ahead of it, and at a distance seems to us not merely to move of themselves, but to govern the ship's movement also. Examining only those expressions of the will of historical persons that were related to events as commands, Historians have assumed that the events depended on the commands. But examining the events themselves and the connection in which the historical characters stood to the masses, we have found that they and their commands were dependent on the events. The incontestable proof of this deduction lies in the fact that however many commands may be given, the event does not take place unless there are other causes for it. But as soon as an event does occur, whatever it may be, then out of a number of repeatedly expressed wishes of different persons, some will always be found by which their meaning and their time of utterance are related to the events as commands. Having reached this conclusion, we can give a direct and positive answer to those two essential questions of history. One, what is power? And two, what force produces the movement of nations? 
Power is the relation of a given person to other persons in which the more that person expresses opinions, suppositions, and justifications of the collective action, the less is his participation in the action. The movement of nations is caused not by power, nor by any intellectual activity, nor even by a combination of the two, as historians have supposed, but by the activity of all the people participating in the event, who always combine in such a way that those who take the largest direct share in the event take the least responsibility, and vice versa. In its moral aspect, the cause of the event appears to be power. In its physical aspect, those who submit to the power. But as the moral activity is inconceivable without the physical, the cause of the event is neither in one nor in the other, but in the combination of the two. Or in other words, the concept of cause is not applicable to the phenomenon we are examining. In the last analysis, we arrive at the circle of infinity, that utmost limit to which in every sphere of thought the human intellect is brought if it is not playing with its subject. Electricity produces heat. Heat produces electricity. Atoms attract one another. Atoms repel one another. Speaking of the interaction of heat and electricity and of atoms, we cannot say why this occurs. And we say that it is so because it must be so. That is a law. The same applies to historical phenomena. Why war and revolution occur, we do not know. We only know that to bring about the one or the other, men form certain combinations in which all participate. And we say that this is so because it is unthinkable otherwise. That is a law.